Please stand by. Good day and welcome to today's webinar. All audience lines will be in a listener-only mode during the program. However, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference. Simply type your question in the Ask a Question box located at the bottom left portion of your screen and then click on the Submit button. Our speakers will address your questions at the end of the program as time permits. If you are having tef technical difficulties with today's presentation, please select the Help button at the bottom of the screen for an event help guide. You may download the slides at any time by clicking the Download Presentation button at the bottom of the screen. Also, a link to the recorded presentation will be sent to you via email after the webinar. At this time, for opening remarks and introductions, I will turn the call over to Victor Wolk. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. My name is Victor Wolk, and I am the Sustainability Advisor at GDF Suez Energy Resources. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar, Reducing Commodity Costs by Integrating Load Analytics, with Eric Alom, Executive Vice President at Veridity Energy. We will conclude the webinar with a question and answer session. Please note that today's web conference is being recorded. Eric Alom, our presenter today, has over 25 years of experience in leading and managing businesses in the energy industry. He is skilled in the areas of strategic planning, financial and product development, as well as trade and risk management. Eric was a founding partner of Skipping Stone, an energy consulting firm that has served the industry for over 12 years, where he developed and led several practice areas. Also as a member of the executive team at World Energy, a leading online energy exchange he led the development and implementation of growth strategies for the company and the streamlining, streamlining of operations. Previously, Eric was also with Commerce Energy Group, where he developed the company's risk management infrastructure and led the company's Sarbanes-Oxley compliance program and rebuilt the sales organization. In addition, Eric has held executive positions with Teneco, Enron, and Pennzoil. Throughout his career, Eric has focused on end use sales with a particular interest in helping large customers optimize their position in the energy market. Right now, Eric. Thank you, Victor, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and there's a disclaimer on slide two. Do you have anything from GDF that you want to say about that? So thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate the opportunity today to come in and talk about uh, the next evolution of change in the retail energy markets and some things that are happening and coming together that are creating a totally new environment to offer up new opportunities for end users such as yourselves to be able to meet and achieve your energy reduction targets going forward. I'm going to spend just uh, about two minutes or less on a little bit of background of who Veridity Energy is as a way to set a foundation for the balance of the discussion. Uh, Veridity Energy is in its sixth year as an organization. It was founded by the former uh, COO and president of PJM and the former president of Alstomesca North America. And as, as Veridity's founders were active in the grid management space, they looked at a problem that was commonly shared by all of the ISOs, that being declining reserve margins. How are we going to meet future demand, maintain reliability on a system in an environment where new generation is increasingly uh, difficult and expensive to site and build? And they said, well, gee, there's an awful lot of load on the system. If we could tap into load as a potential resource to the grid, it would help us to um, offset the declining reserve margins that we see going forward. So they asked themselves, why don't more end users participate with load in the wholesale markets? I recognize that there are really two primary reasons for that. One is most end users don't know how to access those markets or what's available to them. And two, they really don't have the tool set to be able to effectively manage load in a way to make it a consistent and reliable resource for the grid. Consequently, they elected to found uh, Veridity Energy as a company to try and solve both of those problems. Uh, Veridity is a company that's built a technology platform that's really, built a, it's really a tool set for end users to help manage load and provide them with access to the wholesale markets. We're sitting here with GDF today 
because we entered into a partnership with GDF some time ago to look at how you take the uh, the supply procurement position and demand side activities and bring those together in a meaningful way for an end user. So that's my two minutes on, on Veridity, and we can move on now to uh, looking at where all this comes together through tying concepts around the smart grid and the billions of dollars that have been invested in the smart grid to essentially create system reliability at the ISO level and to create accountability between usage patterns and price signals in the marketplace. We've all heard about the smart grid. We've all heard many, many different takes on what it is and what it's all about. And essentially there are uh, there are really two planes on which the smart grid operates. The first is the infrastructure level targeted around the ISOs and the utilities. This is all, it started with real-time monitoring, the concept of interval meters, of smart meters being installed in all of our houses in certain states and, and all the stuff we've been exposed to that created the birth of the big data movement. And big data in the energy business can be, is a complex topic that can be summarized very simply. You take something where millions and millions of people used to have their meter read once every 30 days. Now they have meters that read constantly and continuously, creating an explosion of data management requirements at the infrastructure level. So handling big data became the next phase of the smart grid activity. Once you handle the big data and figure out how to monitor it, then you eventually get around to figuring out solutions that may be actually helpful to people. But in all cases, because you're dealing at the infrastructure level with the ISOs and the utilities, the solutions they eventually create to leverage the access to understanding the load on their system better and matching that to market prices is likely going to be the same kind of one-size-fits-all utility solution that we've all seen over and over again in the energy business. So there's another plane of activity associated with the smart grid, and that's what kind of enablement does it create for you as an end user and an energy participant. So across the bottom of the slide, we have sort of a process flow that shows kind of what that enablement looks like. You also get access to load data. You have better visibility into how you're using electricity, <coughs> excuse me, when you're using electricity, and how you might be able to manage your usage of electricity. Technology enablement comes in the form of a tool set that allows you to visualize that activity and connect it directly to market price signals that allow you to begin to control costs in ways that you've never had access to in the past. As that capability comes together and is coupled with the need and desire to continually reduce your energy spend, it only makes sense to look at the two component parts that, that create that energy cost in the first place, that being the demand or load side and the other being the supply or procurement side. And we'll talk about how those two things come together and how they create a unique solution. The bottom line is that the energy supply chain is inefficient, and any of you who have directly participated in energy procurement and energy supply understand that. On the market side, CNI customers represent a huge amount uh, of, of financial participation in the energy markets, but the typical utility mo model doesn't necessarily address the needs of end users. On the customer side, your energy supply is critical to your business, but in almost in very few cases, is energy a core component of your business focus or business planning? We're seeing a growing role of technology in the energy markets or as, as information flow increases, not just around load, but around price and a number of other things. Uh, and we're also seeing this growing convergence of the need to holistically look at, at how your energy spend is constructed by looking at both demand side activities and supply side activities in a much more integrated fashion. The customers are asking for solutions today. And, and in a, an environment where solutions are needed but is very confusing, the classic sort of quote is, how confusing is it? Well, a picture tells a thousand logos. This is kind of what the energy market has devolved into from a customer's perspective. Very fractured, very fragmented, lots of people with lots of different kinds of answers nibbling around the fringes of the components that make up your overall energy cost. 
So <clears throat> we now understand we have a confusing picture. How do we sort it all out? But we'd like to share just some thoughts with you on that that come from, from uh, my experience and the experience of the companies represented on the call today. And rather than looking at a slide like the previous one with a thousand names on it, and many of them probably you've never heard of, and looking at all the things you don't know, we suggest maybe starting by focusing on the things that you do know. You know and understand what the cost reduction targets and objectives are for your organizations. You know and understand the supply, supply procurement process that you have used to be able to acquire uh, commodity supply in the past. You know what kind of efficiency and sustainability objectives your organization have, and you know what kind of efficiency-related capital projects are sitting on the table. As you, <clears throat> and you also know your process, and you know the assets that consume energy and drive that process. We then suggest that you look at recognizing the fact that the game is changing. Fifteen years ago, none of us really had access to a direct market for electricity. Now, 15 years later, it's become a somewhat mature market. We're looking at another fundamental and significant change because the access to open market, which created cost savings opportunities, has evolved to a level of maturity now where margins have become so slim for suppliers that it's going to be impossible for you to take out the next 5 or 10% of your energy costs simply by getting a sharper price from a supplier. The margins just aren't left there to be able to, to create that opportunity. So we have to find another solution, and that, rec that represents this change. The evolution of the smart grid represents the beginnings of the tool set that allows you to leverage that change. We also <clears throat> suggest that you find a well-positioned and trusted partner who can deliver new value opportunities that capitalize on those changes in the marketplace but also along the way is interested in providing a knowledge transfer and educating you on, on continually being able to look at things that help you meet your goals and objectives, and also has a commitment to truly understanding your business as both a supplier and a services partner. At the end of the day, to sort out the, the confusion that's out, out there in the marketplace now, our sort of overriding thought is an encouragement to you to be willing to explore the art of the possible. There's, there's new tools, new activities, new opportunities. A willingness to step out and look at things a little bit differently is the only entry fee required to potentially open up a whole new world of savings opportunities. Let's talk a little bit about accessing the value of load analytics or being able to see and understand load a little bit more. So we've discussed the fact that part of the smart grid at the individual plane level is going to be creating more and more accountability between the balance of usage and price and cost. So if you're going to have accountability, you better figure out what you can control. For an end user, basically the two things that you can control are your load, how much you consume and when and how, and your price, what kind of price can you negotiate with a supplier. But you also have an emerging toolbox, and on the supply side, that includes the planning and development of your procurement strategy, the products that are out there and to, to be offered, everything from heat rates and block and indexes to tolerance band products to a variety of things that can be constructed now with the tools we have on the supply side, to demand side activities, things as simple as traditional capacity demand response, um, backup generation on site, uh, renewable strategies, energy efficiency projects, etc. So if the two pieces are really the supply side strategy and the demand side strategy, we have to ask ourselves the question, why do we continue to try and manage these things separately? Historically, demand side activities have been the provenance of the operations and process control folks whereas supply-side strategies have been driven mostly by procurement and purchasing activities. I can't tell you the number of times I've sat down with, with end users over the years and, and found that the supply procurement planning and strategy and product that was structured didn't produce the results or the effective hedge that they were looking for simply because somebody on the operations side had implemented a energy efficiency product or project that impacted their load in an unanticipated way from the procurement folks. That kind of disconnect creates both inefficiency and additional cost. 
as we look at the future and how you move forward into an integrated view, bringing the operations and procurement planning and energy strategy activities together is going to be crucial. The reason it's crucial, crucial is that in today's wholesale market, and remember that electricity is the most volatilely traded commodity in the world, the volatility of electricity prices is exponentially higher than any of the other typical commodities. People think of things like foreign exchange or agriculture commodities. The volatility in those markets pales in comparison to electricity. And what that means to you is that load flexibility, even small amounts of load flexibility, can create substantial value in the wholesale market. This starts with traditional reliability programs. I mentioned traditional emergency-based capacity demand response. This is a business that's been around now for a while. Many companies have been very successful in, in growing that business and introducing end users to the concept that the ISOs and the utilities are willing to pay you a standby reservation fee to be able to interrupt your load to a certain level in the event of an emergency on the grid. All that sounds great. Many people have benefited from that. But the fact of the matter is that you, once you enter that program, you're at the beck and call and control of the ISO or the utility running the program. You get called when it's convenient for them, not when it's convenient for you. Consequently, this type of one-size-fits-all program hasn't necessarily been a good fit for all end users. But beyond reliability programs, there's a whole set of activities that take place in the wholesale market where load flexibility can be monetized. So this includes things like economic programs. In PJM, there's a, there's a structured economic program that you can bid into. In ERCOT, it's more a question of being able to work with your supplier to set up the right kind of commodity provisions that allow you to capitalize from reducing your load when prices spike. And then there are also a set of services related to ancillary activities. Ancillaries, are, ancillaries appear on your utility bill as one of those mini line items that sits there that most people don't really get, but add up to significant dollars on your bill. By learning how to control <clears throat> and manage your load to optimize the way you interact with the ancillary markets can make another, it creates another opportunity to, to uh, achieve significant savings. And we're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. On this slide, we see a view of traditional versus what we now call dynamic load management. Traditional demand response, essentially one source of revenue based around emergency response. Somebody tells you when you have to interrupt your load, whether it's convenient for you or not. If it's not convenient, you don't get to participate you may be subject to a penalty or you may be subject to uh, not receiving the full payment that you anticipated from the program. Dynamic load management is all about creating multiple sources of savings and revenue and monetization opportunities by managing and controlling what you do on your end under your timetable when it's convenient for you. So what does this opportunity really look like? Well, it creates a dynamic linkage between the electric grid and the energy consumer. Enabling software like that which is offered by Veridity through GDF and, and others creates that linkage and turns customer energy profiles into assets that can be uh, essentially sold and traded on the grid, but all under your direction and control. An active demand management strategy equals a cost reduction opportunity with minimal or no production impact in many cases. Voluntary energy market participation creates new forms of revenue potential that could also be used to offset your net energy cost. So that all sounds cool, but still really conceptual. Bear with me, I'm getting into more detail as we gradually work our way down uh, through the and, and navigate through this sort of confusing landscape. There are essentially four different broad-based categories around which you can participate in load management. The first in the upper left-hand quadrant is to participate in advanced demand response programs, things like economic, ancillary programs uh, like Sync Reserve and PJM or Responsive Reserve Services and ERCOT, 
Uh, even regulation programs, we have been successful in bringing load-based resources into two-second response uh, regulation programs in certain markets. But in general, even things as simple as HVAC, um, chillers and chiller load, variable frequency drives on, on pumps and motors, uh, you know, as well as generation assets on site, either distributed generation or cogeneration, all of these things can be leveraged very easily into markets that go beyond the traditional emergency capacity markets. On the upper right-hand side, we can begin to talk about a different set of opportunities related to managing your peak demand. Many of the pass-throughs that you see on your energy bills coming from your utilities and suppliers are based on charges that relate to your peak usage. At the transmission level or the ISO level, those charges are often calculated based on how much load you're consuming during a very specific hour at which the system-wide load peaks. So if your load is climbing and helping drive that system load to its peak, you're going to be charged for the rest of the year based on how much you were using during that particular hour. If, on the other hand, you can figure out when the system load is going to peak in those special hours and you're able to reduce your load even fractionally for that specific hour, it reduces the charges you're going to see as pass-throughs for the balance of the year. We'll talk about what some of those values look like in a minute. Another element of peak demand management comes from the distribution level. So we just talked about the transmission level. Now we'll talk about distribution. Depending on where you sit and what utility you're behind, anywhere from 30 to 60% of your overall energy cost and utility bill comes in the form of pass-throughs that are directly related to peak demand charges at the distribution level. Being able to manage and control your peak demand can make a huge impact in creating new savings opportunities as, uh, based on each of those individual line item charges on your utility bill. And the final area, fourth area, of sort of broad-based participation opportunity in load management comes from how you work with your supplier. And integrating a supply contract and product and structure that fits with and allows you to optimize your load flexibility over the course of the year. And that's something that we've worked very uh, closely on with GDF to create some very unique and new opportunities in the market to do some things a bit differently. So let's talk about what this load response part actually means. Well, there's two types. There's what we would call asset level management, and then there's process level management. Well, process level management is the really scary part. That's the one where it says, you're going to ask me to change how I do my operations. Well, maybe, but only if there's an economic value to you there that makes sense. What we can start with is looking at what we call asset level activities. These are things that nibble around the edges and the fringes. You may have a uh, you may have a continuous production process that's untouchable, but there's a variety of things that consume electricity that surround that process that may have more flexibility than you think. And there are opportunities to monetize that kind of load reduction, even if it's small, uh, across, a different, uh, across a variety of areas. Those can be either fast response kinds of programs where we're looking at automated controls, or they can be, in some cases, uh, even longer responses that you could conduct on an annual basis. So once we identify the right load strategies and we've created some load flexibility, then the question, the obvious question is, well, what's it worth to me? This is a very high-level view breaking down just three major markets in PJM, ERCOT, and Nipool on what the kinds of values are that might be available on a, on a value per megawatt year basis. So what this actually says is that um, in PJM, for example, participation in a capacity program, traditional demand response, depending on the year and the region, is in the neighborhood of about $50,000 a megawatt per year. So if you have a five megawatt load and you're willing to, uh, you're willing to 
nominate or bid in up to one megawatt of load reduction at certain times when the ISO calls for it, they'll pay you a standby fee of about $50,000 a year to do that. When you start to look at demand management, you begin to see how these numbers start to add up. So in ERCOT, for example, on the demands, well, let me take, uh, let me come back to ERCOT, let me take Neepool. And on the demand side, just utility demand management alone, this is just the distribution level management of your peak on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, can create up to $60,000 a megawatt uh, in annual savings. The way that we do that is through the technology uh, that I mentioned before and monitoring your load 24-7. You don't have to have an operator sitting there looking at the screens. Technology now exists that will do that for you and make small and minor adjustments that help you avoid setting new utility peaks that cost you more money. On the ancillary services side, as an example in ERCOT, the old LAR program or Responsive Reserve Service program offers significant opportunities for certain types of assets to participate. There are rules and characteristics around every different program, every different opportunity. It's up to it's up to folks like us to figure out the right way to match your capabilities and your appetite to the right programs to create the right monetization vehicle. So how do we do all that and how do we make that work for you? Well, at a minimum, a customer who is willing to begin the process of exploring the art of the possible of these new tools that are available in our deregulated energy markets, we can create in the neighborhood of $2.50 to $6 per megawatt hour in cost savings and reductions. I'm gonna let that number sink in for just a minute. For those of you who are on the phone, who are supply procurement managers who have gone through many negotiations with suppliers and trying to get to the best possible price. And you may see differences in price that range from a nickel to 10 cents to 15 cents a megawatt hour that drive that kind of decision making. I've just thrown something out to you that says sitting out there just waiting to be picked up is value that could be in the neighborhood of 2 to $6 per megawatt hour. These are real numbers, and these are the kinds of numbers that we see from the customers that we engage with. It requires simply looking at an integrated solution that sees both load and supply together. It's monetized through a combination of checks delivered through revenue-type programs and savings received on the energy bill. By combining the demand-side activities with a commodity supply agreement, we actually create a very simple contract and settlement mechanism that didn't exist before. Everything in traditional capacity demand response was always shared, you know, was always a shared savings model. And the ISO pays the CSP, the CSP takes their cut, and eventually they send you a check, and half the time people weren't really sure what account to put the check under and where do I go, where do I process it. By integrating the demand and supply activities, we create a settlement mechanism right through your retail invoice so that all of your savings and all your revenue appear to go directly to the bottom line of offsetting your net energy spend, which helps you to achieve those cost reduction targets that we mentioned before. All in all, we're looking at creating and delivering a lower energy price, more flexibility for you and how you choose to manage load, more capability to allow you to identify load flexibility, and in all cases, the ability to control when and how you do what, instead of simply being in a a box having to respond to what somebody else tells you you must do in the next hour or two hours. So when we bring all this together and look at this integrated view, and we see a convergence of demand and supply side strategies, you can begin to learn how to use your commodity agreement to optimize the value of your load. You can use your load flexibility to benefit from market scarcity at times when prices spike. Now, instead of you know being concerned that prices in ERCOT just hit $2,500 a megawatt hour, you can be looking at that as an opportunity 
say, without really impacting what I'm doing from a production standpoint, I might be able to find a way to cash in on that by exercising uh, some degree of load flexibility at the right times. That comes back to you in the form of revenue and savings that, that goes straight to the bottom line. You can use your position as a load resource to host the capital plays of others. What do I mean by that? This is a little bit longer term strategy, but it starts with a pretty simple concept. As soon as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission unbundled and deregulated the market um, about 15 years ago, 14 years ago, we all became participants in the energy market, whether we wanted to be or not. It's no longer a choice. You can't see that as this thing that's over there and I have a supplier I deal with and he manages all that. Like it or not, because, you're a, because you consume energy, you're a participant in the marketplace. So understanding the marketplace becomes the next logical step. And figuring out how to leverage the tools in the marketplace is what opens the door to opportunity. So one of those things, one of the, building on that concept, one of the things to recognize is that you're a participant as a load. You have a natural short position. People who are looking to site renewable generation or storage through batteries or cogeneration opportunities, et cetera, they're looking for load hosts. There are structures out there that create unique opportunities for you to not only enhance the reliability at your site, but also potentially create additional load flexibility and uh, participate in hosting a, a site for someone else's asset for which they will also pay, creating yet another avenue to reduce your energy cost. The whole idea is to optimize your position, whether they're around soft assets like your fixed price and, and load reduction or hard assets like generation, uh, storage using DR products, advanced DR products, or other forms of participation <coughs> to create uh, the full benefit of, access, of the access to the market that you've been given and that's now evolving more and more every day from the implementation of the smart grid. What we do is we want to examine all the monetization options at your disposal and that ultimately by controlling both of your key variables, supply and demand, you can have them work together to help you achieve your objectives. To give you just a couple of examples, and I won't spend a lot of time, I won't spend a lot of time on these, but I want to, to help people begin to see where, you know, I fit or I don't fit in this equation. Um, one customer was about a 20 megawatt total load and they had two natural gas generators on site, but they had really bad heat rates. So they didn't run very often. People thought they were kind of nice for reliability, but they really don't give us much opportunity because the heat rates are so bad, they're so inefficient, and they're so old. Well, lo and behold, we actually found that that was a way to trigger a series of things that we could do that created about up to six megawatts of controllable load for that customer out of their 20 megawatt total. When you start to apply that flexibility on a minimal basis, we were talking about a few hours here and there a month, uh, we were able to create an increase of about five times in what their traditional demand response participation was, was creating for them. In other words, they participated in a utility demand response program that paid them about $250,000 a year. But the things that we did in leveraging the assets that we found without interrupting the activity at the facility, we were able to take that up to a million dollars plus in annual savings from just leveraging that load flexibility. Another, and so you might look at that and say, well, I'm not 20 megawatts. I don't have six megawatts of controllable load. Those numbers don't mean anything to me. Well, let's take a look at what was essentially an office building that housed a research lab that had about three megawatts of, of three to four megawatts of total load. Only 300 kW of load reduction for that particular customer and the way that it was applied created, depending on the year, anywhere from two to $350,000 in incremental annual value that was used to offset their energy spend. A, you know, a $200,000 annual reduction 
in the energy spend associated with the 4 megawatt total load made a significant impact on her operation. And this is not unusual. I have another customer not represented on this particular slide that's an industrial facility that's a 24-7 continuous operation, totally distributed, meaning that they don't have one they don't have one production line that's easy to get at. They have literally hundreds of pieces of small equipment doing assembly. And they looked at that and said, well, there's no way we can harness all this stuff. And we said, you don't have to. What we were able to do is find no more than about 300 kW of load that, was, that had some flexibility, and primarily through just utility demand management, just managing their utility peaks, We've been able to create in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 thousand dollars a year in cost reduction for them, which translates to about a five percent overall net reduction in their energy spend. So all this sounds great. The question becomes, how do I get? How do I do this? How do I get involved in this? How do I understand how it fits me? Well, you have to understand that each end user is different. Each facility is different. Each answer is going to be different for each end user. This doesn't really sound like a commodity market anymore, does it? Commoditized markets are all about creating standardized solutions and shoving them down people's throat at the lowest possible price. This is a little bit different than that, and this represents one of those fundamental changes that we see happening in the marketplace. The commodity business is mature. It is what it is. Prices are what they're going to be, and the margins are as low as they can get. So where do I go next to find the next level? Well, I go a little bit away from the commodity space and I start looking at what do I know about my organization, what do I know about my operation, how do I get with somebody who can translate that knowledge into market access in a new way that creates new opportunities for me. As we said before, the common thread is the willingness to explore the art of the possible. You need to be willing to sit down with somebody and talk about how can I access some of this value? It's our job, along with GDF, to bring the right types of market tools to you to be able to create those solutions, and most importantly, to distill all the complexity down into something that creates actionable uh, decision-making information for you. One of the aspects of our founders when they built the technology platform and the tool set was to create an environment where you don't have to think about you know, 16 different potential demand response programs and, and all the complexity of the moving prices that go along with the wholesale market, but rather be able to show you something that says, if you execute load reduction strategy one that we agreed to together, during this two-hour period, it could be worth $17,420. At $17,420, you might be willing to execute that load reduction strategy. At $2,710, you may not. It's our job to be able to show you what makes sense to you so that you can exercise the right business judgment based on the things that make sense to you. So be willing to take control. Provide yourself with the right toolbox. GDF is one commodity supplier that's already moving toward a broader solution orientation. They want to get more involved with the customer. They want to help understand better how you use energy so they can understand how better help you meet your objectives. So let them use the tools to, to create the right answer for your business. To give you an idea of what some of this kind of looks like, um, the next slide is just a screenshot of one of uh, several screens that exist in, in the peak management service that's being offered now through, uh, through GDF and through the enabling of, tech, of Veridity's technology. Many of you may have already seen or been exposed to PLC or 4CP management services that appear in your inbox every day in the form of an email. And you get an email that says, today is not a 4CP day, or today is not a PC, PLC day, or today might be a PLC day or a 4CP day. And it could occur sometime between, say, 1 o'clock this afternoon and 7 o'clock tonight. Okay, well, that's interesting. But how many people are actually going to take steps to significantly reduce their consumption for a five- or six-hour period hoping to hit a single hour? 
Our approach is a little bit different. We give you access to a variety of pertinent information that allows you to make better decisions. You see, you always see the current week and what's happening each day of the week and what's projected to happen during that week. There is also a forward view that shows you next week so that you have up to 14 days of advanced planning of knowing when we are potentially likely to see a CP hour. We then provide alert notification that bans that hour uh, usually around no more than a 30-minute window, making it much easier for people to actually take action and hit the appropriate hour. We also offer all of this information, including uh, graphs that show you system load, current system load on a real-time basis, against projected day-ahead load and projected real-time load so that you can see if load is outstripping projections, which could tell you that it may be more likely uh, to hit a system peak or less likely, depending on the case. And then we also show you graphs that give you an idea of what the historical peaks are to date and what the relevant peaks are and how that lays out against the next several days forecast. And all that information is available to you not once a day in an email in an inbox, but it's available 24-7 anytime you want to go to it for planning purposes and it's continuously updated there. That's good. <clears throat> this next slide is kind of busy and I'm not going to go through much detail on it, but I wanted you to just have a sense of, I keep talking about this tool set, I wanted you to have a sense of what that tool set uh, can look like. There are there are screens that allow you to visualize your load activity. There, we provide you with pertinent information relative to weather, relative to system load, relative to system pricing, um, and commentary from uh, a network operations center that's actually monitoring this for you all the time. We don't expect you to have yet another screen to sit, to sit in front of all day long. We expect to provide you with a place to go and quickly be able to get a snapshot of exactly what's happening at your plant or your facility and be able to turn that into actionable decision making while we're doing the monitoring the rest of the time. So this gives you an idea of some of the things that you would see uh, related to monitoring your real-time load, relating, relating to monitoring how you're doing when you've enacted a curtailment strategy uh, to, follow, to follow an event, you can see your load actually dropping and going down. Screens that allow us to set targets for you. Say, I want to reduce my utility demand management exposure by 5%. And we overlay that target and we can watch your real-time load approach that target. As it approaches the target, we can send an alert. We can, we can execute certain load reduction strategies that prevent you from setting that peak and ensuring that you hit your target, but always with, the, always with the ability for you to say, no, I understand what I'm exposed to, I understand where it's going. Based on what's happening today at my facility, I'm not going to do anything, that's fine. So in kind of wrapping up the information and content part of this presentation, uh, we thought we'd show you something that was just very colorful and busy. Um, essentially, summarizing all of this, we enable insight, action, and results through the combination of GDF's ability to leverage Veridity's technology platform, combine it with its supply, its, its supply commodity offerings, and create new solutions for customers out of new tools that have, been, that have emerged in the marketplace. Very consistent with GDF's history of being probably the most transparent and sophisticated uh, risk management provider in the commodity business. They see this as a logical extension and a way to convey additional transparency, knowledge transfer, and open up those new markets, avenues, and opportunities for their customers to achieve uh, their overall goals and objectives with minimal or no impact on the production and operation side of your business. So I think now we kind of open it up for questions. Yeah, Eric, thanks so much uh, for that presentation, really very informational. Uh, Eric said we're going to start uh, answering some questions. Once again, you can enter questions at the left of your screen in the Ask a Question window. Uh, we will answer as many questions as time permits. 
we have we have several right now, and I'll ask you the first one, Eric. Next is, uh, are there some price structures within a supply contract that are more advantageous for load management strategies? Yeah, excellent question, and uh, the the short answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the the longer answer and, and more complicated is that there are different elements in the structure of a commodity supply pricing agreement that that you need to be aware of, and that includes how pass-throughs are handled uh, around certain line items. Like, for example, in PJM, some supply commodity agreements fix the PLC charge. If you're dealing with a fixed price PLC charge. It's no different than any other fixed price. You're paying a premium for certainty. And if you reduce load at the right time to reduce your PLC exposure, you're not going to realize that PLC exposure because you're on a fixed PLC pass-through. So making a decision about do I want to manage my exposure and therefore be able to reduce that exposure over time, or do I want to lock in a fixed pass-through amount for that let my supplier take all that risk, and, I, and, and it doesn't matter what I use. It's sort of the way you can look at one of those pieces of the equation. The same thing can be true at the demand level with the utility side and other components of your fixed price, whether you have a block and index, for example, or whether you have a tolerance band product where you have plus or minus 10 or 20% swing or whatever the structure may be. So there's a lot of variables that go into it, and it's exactly why we talk about looking at beginning to converge your thought processes and planning for demand-side strategies and supply-side strategies so that you have the optimal makeup based on what you're willing to do, what you're willing to control, and manage on the load side so that it matches up appropriately and you have the right pricing structure. Thank you. Next question. Uh, because PJM or your, or your utility adds back your summer DRKW reduction to your PLC, you can't double dip, meaning you can't participate in the demand response program and reduce PLC. Please address and advise. Uh, another excellent question and absolutely correct. PLC is an alternative way to get at the same value that you can get from capacity participation in PJM. And what I mean by that is we talked about emergency response not necessarily being the best answer for all end users because you're at the beck and call of the ISO and you're told to reduce at certain times, which typically tend to be inconvenient for the participants. PLC is an alternative way to get the same amount of value that you would receive from a capacity standby payment simply by managing your load in those specific hours that you can see coming gives you a little bit better advanced planning, gives you more opportunity to decide whether I want to participate or not. In PJM, the CP hours that are pertinent, there are five. So even if you decide what's happening at your facility doesn't allow you to reduce load for this particular CP hour, that doesn't mean you lose the complete opportunity. You simply lost one of the CP hours or 20% of the total value for the year in, in managing PLC. So <clears throat> the you need to understand PLC as an alternative to capacity. Pick which one is right for you, which one makes more sense, and work with somebody, work with the right entity uh, to help guide you through that process. One word on capacity, and one of the reasons more people are asking these kinds of questions now, we're seeing changes in the capacity markets. In ERCOT, uh, we're seeing uh, dialogue and discussion and new rules in ERCOT that will allow ERCOT to call their emergency response program at uh, lower levels of emergency conditions than what it's historically been. In PJM, they have passed a new rule that will be effective in 2015, uh, unless it gets changed, that reduces the response time for capacity uh, demand response from two hours historically down to 30 minutes. That's a big change for people, <clears throat> going from I have to do something in 30 minutes that I used to do in two hours is going to cause people to look at the capacity programs differently. And then additionally, PJM has been very forthright and has published a number of things in the public domain talking about the fact that they fully intend to begin to 
call and leverage their demand or their capacity programs uh, more frequently going forward. So capacity, as capacity becomes a less attractive option, PLC management becomes a much more attractive option for some people. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, any type of vertical sector or customer type that are better than others for uh, load management strategies? Uh, good question. Short answer is uh, anybody who's ready to explore it has the, has the right criteria and characteristics uh, to begin to look at things. And so with that being the short answer, it means that anybody can do this. Uh, the longer answer is that complexity is a good thing. The more complexity, the more opportunity to find areas of load flexibility that can add up. Um, and there are certain types of businesses and assets that lend themselves well to this and some that don't. For example, if I take refrigeration and storage as an example and, and food processing, depending on what activities within that industry space you're involved in, you may either be a great candidate for this or not such a good candidate for this. And the only way to find out is to, is to begin to explore it with somebody. Uh, industries such as uh, pulp and paper uh, or uh, steel and metals products can be great candidates for this because they typically tend to be more batch, pro uh, batch manufacturing oriented, uh, heavily asset laden, largely energy intensive, and typically are under a lot of uh, pressure from their internal markets to be able to reduce costs because of the global competitive environment that they find themselves in. Uh, chemical companies, refineries have been running refinery operations based on you know, linear optimization of all the inputs and variables into their cost structure for years and years. And yet refineries are, you know, are a prime candidate for certain types of load management that may go beyond what they're doing today. Commercial office buildings, uh, we serve many, many of the famous skyscrapers in New York, including uh, the Helmsley Building and uh, Empire State Building and a bunch of others that uh, you probably would have heard of, where we're finding anywhere from a megawatt to two megawatts a controllable load just from an HVAC standpoint in a commercial high-rise. So it varies across industries. Key criteria, be willing to look at it. Second criteria um, is help us understand what you're willing to do, and we can create the right solution or determine whether it's the right fit. Great, great. Uh, next question, what is the minimum amount of KW participation in the man management program? Are there any risks or a margin of commitment from the customer? Okay. Um, Minimum, minimum requirements vary by program, by market, and by, you know, by utility and ISO. Uh, many times a good sort of rule of thumb is about 100 kW is, is a sort of a typical minimum participation threshold. However, uh, many utilities allow aggregation of load to get to that 100 kW minimum threshold. Uh, typically for uh, I don't want to speak for GDF, but I, I would say that uh, typically in our partnership with GDF Suez, uh, we find that you know we're looking for anywhere from you know 300, 500 kW on up, and the larger the volume, the more opportunity generally we can find for the customer. Sort of a sweet spot for this is would be anyone that's and I'll call it two sweet spots. Uh, one for sort of a fairly active solution would be a customer that's maybe at least two, three megawatts in, in total load, up to 15, 20, and, and above megawatts of total load. For a different kind of solution, which could be, for example, a demand strategy, demand, a load management strategy bundled into a commodity price that gives you a discount up front, which I would call sort of a passive or minimal activity involvement. I think that's the kind of thing that could go down into smaller levels. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Another, another question. Uh, can load management strategies uh, enhance uh, new technologies such as solar development and storage? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we're very actively involved in looking at how you use um, renewable assets like batteries, for example, and the revenue streams that we can create by taking those assets into the wholesale market and using that to accelerate the return on invested capital associated with those projects in the first place. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very big emerging business for us and, and our company. Uh, and it's one that, uh, that we're seeing get a lot of traction, particularly in certain states, uh, New Jersey, which is big on solar, California, for example, and others. So absolutely uh, finding new ways to leverage assets that used to be looked at as reliability-based and turning those into economic assets accelerates the return on invested capital associated with the capital project decisions. Eric, thanks so much. That was the final and last question. In closing, we never like to end our webinars without mentioning that we want to hear from our participants. You will be receiving a survey, and we encourage you to take five minutes of your time to provide us with the input or how we did and feedback on what would you like to see further with GDF Suez and the seminars. Once it is available, you will also receive the link to today's recorded webinar. Thank you again for joining us today, and please feel free to contact your GDF Suez sales representative for any questions or uh, further comments on this webinar. Thanks so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's conference, and we do thank you for your participation.